welcome to Deeply Curious. My name is Cody Jensen, and joining me in our New York City studio apartment is my wife, Sarah. Hello. And if we look extra glistening on the video, it's because it is full summer in New York City. Yes, it is. And speaking of that, there's no better way to cool down in the summer than a nice... Oh. Ah. <laughs> Hint fist. <laughs> It's true, though, when we got home, because it's like 100 degrees today, we got home and I just downed an entire bottle of Hint. It's so good. But that was my segue to say that this podcast is sponsored by Hint. Hint is a flavored water company that makes still and sparkling versions of their flavored water. You can get Hint by going to hint.co slash deeply curious. You can also get it in like pretty much... Most or all grocery stores. They have uh, trucks running around New York, too. Oh, yeah. Right now. Um, so, drink water, not sugar, and uh, get your hint on. Mm-hmm. Okay, for this podcast, this uh, particular episode, I want to continue our kind of series, um, our ongoing conversation on personality. Mm-hmm. The very first podcast that we did, in general, was about introversion and extroversion. And then, I mean, it's kind of an ongoing theme of just like self-awareness and personality. That just seems to be psychology in general, like seems to be a conversation that we have often. Yeah. (laughs) Um, And so I'm going to go ahead and keep on that uh, boat for at least one more episode. Um, (laughs) And for this one, I was listening to Malcolm Gladwell's Revisionist History podcast, which is like one of my top Mm -hmm. five like favorite podcast and in this uh last uh this week's episode was about um malcolm gladwell's like 12 rules for life and he doesn't actually have 12 rules that was the title of it um well that's a little misleading (laughs) yeah um he only had he only had one rule um maybe two if you count a uh, teaser at the end but he (laughs) um talks about the big five um in in this podcast and it's what the big five is, is a personality kind of rating system, and it's a widely used personality rating system uh, among psychologists. So whenever psychologists are studying a person, they, um, depending on you know what style they are, but widely used is this um, personality kind of test, I guess, on I, um, I would just say measuring they, people's like characteristics. Yeah, I would say it's not a test. They more just measure on a scale where you are in these five traits. Right. And one of those is introversion or extroversion. It's called extroversion, and you're on a scale of, of, of being like, you know, 100 is full extrovert, zero is full introvert. And every characteristic has like, you know, good qualities and bad qualities, you know, depending on which side of the scale you're on. Mm-hmm. The It's actually the Goldberg, um, I guess, system or primary factors or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, and it is extroversion, agreeableness, consciousness, Conscientiousness? Con- Conscientiousness. Yeah, we'll go with that. Uh, <laughs> neuroticism and openness to experience. So, uh, and not in that order, but in a different order that, uh, uh, what do you call those? Um, like whenever you take the first letter of each word and it makes another word. Acronym? Yeah, acronym. I think that's right. Um, <laughs> so the if you rearrange those in not that order and make an acronym, it is OCEAN uh-huh. um, to help you remember. Um, but... The O in ocean is openness to experience. So I want to I wanna quickly kind of go through each one of these. We can talk about where we feel like we fit mm-hmm. on this, on each one of these scales. But also there's one of them that I particularly want that interests me the most and that I want to talk about. Okay. It, it intrigues me the most. I, I, I uh, keep thinking about it. Okay. So openness to experience. Um, openness to experience has been described as the depth of... And complexity of an individual's mental life and experience. It can also be sometimes called intellect or imagination. Openness to experience concerns an individual's willingness to try new things, be vulnerable, and the ability to think outside the box. Okay. What do you think? Where do you, where do you think you fit on? Do you think you're? I op- think I'm very open. open. I mean, I very much value experiences, um, and like learning new things and I feel like I'm a very all my personality tests say I'm a very adaptable person um I feel like I'm pretty open I feel like I'm high on that scale yeah I I feel like I'm probably pretty high on that scale as well as well as well (laughs) um uh, some like southern coming out there (laughs) 
Well, <laughs> um, so some characteristics of that is imaginative, insightful, wide, variety of interests. <laughs> There was a, the, on the website, there was a picture in between the words wide and variety. <laughs> the, that, one of the characteristics is wide. Uh, original, daring, preference for variety, clever, creative, curious, perspe- perspective, perceptive. Um, perceptive. Reading is not one of them. Intellectual, <laughs> uh, complex, and deep. I mean, I think just the fact that our podcast is called Deeply Curious. Yeah kind of explains that we're pretty open people yeah i feel like we both score like pretty high on the openness to experience and like the fact that we sold everything moved to new york like with no necessarily necessarily like a plan or like yeah whatever um i love experiences preference for variety like so true very true daring i mean creative like i feel like that is one that we definitely score like pretty high eat like yeah, that both of us right. are just court high in. Uh, so the next one in, in Ocean is uh, conscientiousness. Mm-hmm. I think I got it that time. Um, <laughs> so conscientiousness is a trait that can be described as the tendency to control impulses and act on socially acceptable ways and act in socially acceptable ways. Behaviors that uh, facilitate goal-directed behavior. Conscientious people excel in their ability to delay gratification, work well with rules, and plan and organize effectively. I feel like uh, that for me depends on like where I'm at in my health scale probably. But I feel like I have the capability to be very high, to score high on that. Mm -hmm. Because I think, um, what did it say? Like, I do, I think I do delay gratification in certain scenarios Mm -hmm. i definitely like am very like aware of socially acceptable behaviors because i very much like um i guess edit what i say out loud (laughs) because like in in certain settings Mm -hmm. um and i am capable of like working within the rules and organizing and all of that stuff if i see a point to it like i i like breaking rules but because it's fun but i see if i see a point to the rule then i'm totally fine with following it does that make sense yeah like i i don't i don't do well with just rules with like unnecessary who cares stupid petty rules yeah but i'm okay with following a rule if i understand the point of it yeah the why of it yeah yeah i feel like that i almost delay gratification to a fault You absolutely delay gratification (laughs) to a fault. It's so annoying. Yeah. Sometimes. (laughs) (laughs) Like, I feel like that one's maybe a little too strong in me. Yes, because a lot of times you're like, oh, man, I would love to, whatever, get this thing or do this thing. Or I'm like, just do it. We have the means. We have the ability and the time and the whatever. Just do it. And you're like, no. Like, why? There's literally no reason not to. Because it's, it, yeah, just, I mean, it's just not a good idea, like, for the time. I mean, like, I, I got to think about. Um, no, you have to enjoy life a little. No, I got to think about future Cody <laughs> and what, what future Cody is going to need from from okay. past Cody. And but maybe future Cody needs past Cody to have fun. Well, yes. And well, there is a lot of times that I <laughs> have not allowed myself to have fun experiences because of like finances, you know, mm-hmm. just saying like, I don't know. I mean, that's like $50 to go do that. Whereas I'm you like, know. yeah, it's only $50. <laughs> to <go do> that. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I think that delayed gratification is ultimately a good thing. Um, in that like, I mean, like, the, like the Barbara Kruger shirt that you have, that's like, want it, buy it, forget it. It's mm-hmm. like, everybody is so impulsive and so quick to, mm-hmm. and by everybody, I mean, like our generation, yeah. like is general, like very impulsive. And it's like, you see it and you buy it. And then like three days later, you YOLO. Like, yeah, it's like <laughs> in the moment you needed it. Right. Whereas I, I am like, because of that part of my personality, there's rarely a time like it's obviously it happens sometimes, but like there's rarely a time where where that happens, and I'm like, right. I see something, and immediately it's like, I cannot leave this place without buying that thing. Yeah, but I think if you put it in perspective of not buying things but doing things, again, we're talking about experiences. Right. Like that, I feel like 
maybe that's where I have no self-control because I don't care about, like, I think it's totally fine to spend so much money. I mean, obviously in a smart way, don't like put it on credit cards and go into debt and do all this crap. But like spending money on an experience is totally worth it. Whereas you're like, "Mm, I don't know, we just probably shouldn't. Mm -hmm. I'm like, well, we're only here for a day. Let's just go to the play or whatever it right. is. You know? That's actually one of my, um, speaking of, so I'm going to say my biggest regret, but one of my biggest regrets, but I also, I just had a thought of like regrets in general and how, especially with, um, experiences. I also, I, what I'm saying is my personality is conflicting because mm-hmm. I have this like delayed gratification type thing and like hold back from doing things. But I also have the, at the exact same time, hold the belief that you only will regret the experiences you don't have. Mm-hmm. Um, it's like there is very rarely a time whenever you actually do something, you have an experience that like you look back and regret doing that. Even thing. if even, it was awful. Even if it was bad. You're like, man, I'm still glad that I did that. Yeah. It's I learned like, something. Yeah. It's yeah. In, instead of like looking back and be like, oh man, I really regret not doing that. Like you, right. those come way more often mm-hmm. than even if you had a bad experience, you still like, I'm still glad I did it. Mm-hmm. And what I was going to say is that our on our honeymoon, I did that. Mm-hmm. Well, I think we both did it, but it was that. We went on a cruise and whenever we like went to one of the stops or destinations or whatever, we like, we went off the boat and like explored right off the boat, but it would have cost us like, (laughs) yeah, it was free. And it would have only cost us like, I don't know, less than $50, like to get a taxi to go to the beach where like all this amazing like stuff was to like snorkel and like hang out. I mean, even, even if we didn't spend any more money, we just hung out on the beach. Yeah. Would have been way more of an enjoyable experience. Yeah. But we didn't because we wanted, we were like, I don't know. It's like, well, because we were 18 and yeah. like didn't have any money, yeah. you know, we were like, we, we really shouldn't spend but 50 We could have made up that $50. But oh, yeah, it would have been so easy. Yeah. Okay. So that's your biggest regret, though? No, I said one of my biggest regrets, oh. like as far as experience goes. Oh. Yeah. That's shocking because I don't even, I mean, that doesn't even pop up in my head with experiences. What's one of your biggest regrets? I think just like not traveling as much. It's kind of the same thing, but I don't, it's not like one specific instance. I think like we just for a long time thought we couldn't afford anything, but it's not true. Like you just allocate your budget for it and we just didn't do it. Yeah. But I don't have one particular instance that I regret. Yeah. I feel, I, I, same. I mean, I, I think that we could have been more like open to just going and traveling and stuff we were i was very uh like insistent Mm. that we could not spend money ever insistent is the word (laughs) (laughs) which the traits for conscientiousness um are persistent uh ambitious thorough self-disciplined constant predictable controlled reliable resourceful hardworking, energetic persevering and a planner which is you. I would say I'm I'm a few of those things. Like, I immediately identify with a few of those characteristics. But like I said, for me, it depends on, like, my health level. Mm-hmm. Whereas I feel like for you, that's just who you are always and forever. Yeah, I'm pretty consistent in that. <laughs> Been pretty predictable and reliable. And, uh, yeah. Uh, so the next one is extroversion, which we did a whole show about this. So yeah. the first podcast we did, introversion versus extroversion, um, to hit on that. This factor has two f- familiar ends within the spectrum, extroversion and introversion. It concerns where the individual draws their energy and how they interact with others. So in general, ex- extroverts draw energy and recharge from interacting with others, while introverts get tired from interacting with others and replenish their energy with solitude. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, Sarah is... The definition of introvert. Mm-hmm. I love people, though. I feel like we should throw that out there. Yeah. Well, I mean, even in this article. Yeah, that's true because they, it does, like, the qualities of extrovertedness is sociable um, and, like. Outgoing, uh, energetic, um, merry. Yeah. Fun-loving. Like, yeah. Introverts are that, too, just in a right. different way. Yeah. Which we had a whole conversation about. Yeah, yeah, I'm not going to go on my soapbox. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Soapbox is the uh, word there, Sarah. Uh, If you want to hear more about introversion and extroversion, uh, listen to the first episode of Deeply Curious. And 
So on the spectrum, Sarah's like high over on the introversion side. Yeah. And I am slightly on the introversion side, but more of an ambervert than I am either one of them. I would say you're definitely an ambervert. You may have been, you may be more introverted the older you've gotten, but I mean, you're definitely capable of like holding center of attention. Yeah, but I don't know if that necessarily has anything to do with being introverted or extroverted. If you're talking the introversion is just drawing energy from being alone. Yeah, but there are certain characteristics of introverts and extroverts. Yeah. And I feel like like you going into the middle of anywhere and just dancing is not something an introvert typically does. Like you are very capable capable of being like the life of the party. Mm-hmm. Um, and you wouldn't really describe an introvert that way. Yeah, I mean, I think I am probably just like the true definition of an ambervert. Um, I think you can. I think you can just play to whatever. Yeah, because I, I don't. I think I draw energy from both. Yeah. Like I, I feel myself whenever I'm in a group of people or hanging out with, you know, even just one other person or whatever. Like it, it, it just hanging out with people, I draw energy from, mm-hmm. and having conversations like energizes me and get and like helps me like whatever. Yeah. Be energized. Uh, but also. I can totally just be by myself and be totally yeah. like. I think, okay, the question though is how are you at like parties? Because I also very much enjoy small group social situations. Like I feel like I get a lot of, of energy from that. Mm-hmm. I mean, I still have to go home and like recharge, but I feel like excited about the conversations I had. Whereas like at a party or if I'm walking into like an unknown situation i am just the most awkward person (laughs) so like how do you do you feel like you draw energy from that situation i definitely do or maybe people just in general don't actually draw energy from that yeah i mean i definitely do not i'm not very good at like walking into a place where i don't know people and being like hey my name is cody what's your name like Mm -hmm. what's going on how's your day Blah, blah blah like that i'm terrible at but if I walk into any social scenario where I actually know, the, even if I only just kind of know the people, mm-hmm. I can walk in and like totally dominate, like just begin dancing immediately. Like, yeah, like it doesn't. It's just that I don't I think I don't know if that's introversion, extroversion or if there's just some people who are good at like meeting people, being first interactors or whatever. Right. Versus like just not whether you're an introvert or extrovert or not. Like, yeah, I don't know. I don't know, but I know that I'm not good at that. Like, Mm -hmm. well, I would say I'm not naturally good at that. Right. If I prepare myself before and I'm like, okay, I'm about to go into this situation, walk in there and like, I feel like that's what introverts just do it. Would do. Yeah. Maybe you're more introverted in that scenario. Yeah. But also I I can, could, could just like, not that commanding a room is not something an introvert can do because introverts definitely can. do that all the time as well because it's public speaking is one of like introverts like strengths mm-hmm. okay um i'm gonna skip the next one because i i want to uh have a conversation longer about that um, okay. um so the in in ocean is neuroticism this is the the fifth one we're gonna come back to four and neuroticism is one of the big five factors in which the high score indicates more negative traits Mm -hmm. so with the pre with all the other ones a high score is positive and or just indicates positive traits right not necessarily that it's a good thing yeah um but neuroticism is one factor of uh neuroticism is not a factor of meanness or incompetence but one of confidence and being comfortable in one's own skin Mm -hmm. and encompasses one's emotional stability and a general temper Mm -hmm. so the general traits commonly associated with neuroticism is uh (laughs) awkward pessimistic moody jealous testy testes uh fearful nervous anxious timid wary self-critical unconfident uh, insecure, unstable, or oversensitive. I feel like I'm probably pretty high on that. Really? Yeah. I feel like... Um, well, because it does say those high in neuroticism are generally given to anxiety, sadness, worry, and low self-esteem. Right. Which, which my Enneagram, tell, literally the sentence is prone to chronic low self-esteem. So that's cool. Um, <laughs> but, but like, I feel like 
a lot of people don't recognize that in me. I, I feel like I get it a lot. Like, mm-hmm. oh, but you're so calm. You're so peaceful. You're so whatever. I think because I I know how to present myself and not that I'm like putting on a front. I don't feel like I'm putting on a front, mm-hmm. but I'm generally in public pretty calm and like reserved and whatever. I'm not like a crazy. I, d- I don't know. I, I feel like I'm calm, but like inside i feel like i'm all of those things yeah that is probably the weirdest thing about you that uh, like what you're saying just i agree because i mean we i think we talked about this in the enneagram podcast last week is that for like the first two years of our marriage i didn't even know that you Mm -hmm. had anxiety Mm -hmm. like because you you hide it so well i guess yeah that's um again one of the like major things i've learned from like all of the other personality things that I've taken, like the Myers-Briggs, the Enneagram, the Berkman. Um, Because I used to have all these people who would say, who were like shocked when they found out I was introverted or shocked when they found out that I didn't view myself as like a peaceful person Mm -hmm. or um, some, like that even happened to me like literally last week. Uh, I said something about like, oh, I really need to work on like peace. Like Mm -hmm. I need to find peace. And someone's like, but you're but you're so peaceful. I'm like, I, that is the opposite of how I feel like 98% of the time. And so I think I, I don't pretend like I don't put on a front. It's just like how I, I don't really, under, I don't know how to explain it really, but it's just how I, I know how, what's acceptable, I guess. Mm-hmm. And then like, I kind of hide behind whatever. Um, so I, I feel like a lot of people don't really recognize that in me, but it's the truth. Like, I'll just like go through when I'm again, this is on a scale of health for me, Mm -hmm. um, but like awkward. Yeah. Um, I would say I can be pretty pessimistic. Um, maybe not in like a general, no, I don't know. Maybe general outlook. I don't know. I feel like I can like get caught up in like the pessimistic things, moody, um, fearful, nervous, anxious, Um, I think I used to be a lot more timid than I am now. That was a thing I had to really like work on being more assertive, Mm -hmm. um, self-critical, unconfident, insecure. Um, I don't know what unstable means, but I don't feel like that really. Yeah. But all of those other ones. Yes. I I feel like I I would rank pretty high on neuroticism. I feel like I would be pretty low on this i feel like you're a zero (laughs) you're like a zero and i'm a (laughs) hundred i mean i can be awkward but i mean i think it's in a different way yeah it's not like sometimes i choose to be awkward because i think it's hilarious i don't understand that at all (laughs) (laughs) i just like throwing people into awkward situations or saying things that make the room awkward and then just leaving it just just because it's funny i'm just like in the corner like (laughs) hiding my face but i think even without choice though i think that sometimes i can just be awkward Mm -hmm. um, pessimistic uh i feel like you're pretty even keel like yeah i would describe you more as a realist than yeah pessimistic or optimistic definitely not moody um (laughs) pretty steady (laughs) uh but as far as like I, i i rarely feel anxious like, yeah. In a, like anxiety type stuff. Like, you are literally just the most even keel person I have ever met. I mean, I don't just even. Just solid. But I don't even know, like. It's not like I chose that, you know? Like, it just. Oh, I know. I mean, I didn't choose to, That's true. to be crazy, you know? Yeah. It's, I've just, and like, especially like confident, like, I. Oh, yeah. You're so confident and secure. You're not insecure at all. Which. So, the keeping on that track. This is what I want to get to on the next one. The the E and uh, or sorry the uh, okay. the A and Ocean. Okay. Is agreeableness. Uh huh. So, uh, let me read this. Uh, we'll kind of talk about it. Okay. I don't know. <laughs> I have a lot to say. Okay. <laughs> so, agreeableness. Uh, this factor concerns how well people get along with others. While extroversion concerns sources of energy in the pursuit of interactions with others, agreeableness concerns your orientation to others. It is a construct that rests on how you generally 
interact with others. Okay. So the following traits fall under the umbrella of agree- agreeableness. Altruistic, trusting, modern, no modest, uh, modest, humble, patient, moderate, tactful, polite, kind, loyal, unselfish, helpful, sensitive, amiable, cheerful, considerate. So people high in the agreeableness tend to be well-liked, respected, and sensitive to the needs of others. And they likely have few enemies, are sympathetic and affectionate towards their friends and loved ones, as well as sympathetic to the plights of strangers. Mm-hmm. Um, but on the low end of that, people uh, on the low end of the agreeable in the spectrum are less likely to be trusting, uh, less, like, le- less likely to be trusted and l- liked by others. And they tend to be callous, blunt, rude, ill-tempered, antagonistic, and sarcastic. Although not all people who are low in the agreeableness are cruel or abusive, they are not likely to leave others with a warm and fuzzy feeling. Mm -hmm. So we can kind of just break that down like we did the rest of them. And I mean, where do you you want me to go first? Yeah, that way, since you have a lot to say, apparently, (laughs) Um, I would say I'm very high in agreeableness. uh, Generally speaking, I think like my Berk, my Berkman says, like I'm very oriented toward people so I can be, I think that's why people mistake me as an extrovert sometimes because I, I choose to be around people instead of on my own, even though maybe sometimes I'd rather be on my own. Um, and I, I just, I really, I love people. Um, so I just always choose to be around people. And I feel like people mistake that as extroversion when really it's just that I like people. Mm -hmm. Um, so I would say I'm pretty high on agreeableness, which is maybe why people don't see my high neuroticism actually. Hmm. Cause I feel like I'm oriented toward people. So like Mm -hmm. I read them really well Yeah, and don't really put forth like at least in person, I can write whatever online and without a problem but like in person telling someone the things that i write on my instagram is just like not possible (laughs) so maybe that's why i don't know yeah so as far as where i score on the agreeableness Mm -hmm. factor yeah is i mean i think that i i probably score lower Mm -hmm. um definitely than you yeah um and part of me based on some other information that i'll share in a second i would say that i'm like very low uh-huh. but if i just read this right um i would say that i mean i'm not that low just because i don't feel like a lot of this um because if you were to say like the the high the high end of the spectrum is described by altruistic mm-hmm. which i think i have um mm-hmm. and trusting i think i have um modest humble um i mean maybe not like the most yeah, but I wouldn't say you're like boastful. Um, I'm very patient, um, for the most part. I mean, would you agree? I guess. I mean, it's kind of hard to say if you're patient or not. Yeah, I think so. I think it it's really hard for you because it depends on. I think it depends a lot on the situation and like yeah where you're at in your head. So, for example, and you've learned how to fix this, right? Mm-hmm. You've learned how to correct it. So. But if you think about the way you like initially react, that's what all of this is, right? Right. Not like ways you've learned how to deal, but like Mm -hmm. how you initially react. When you are in like what we call, what we have decided to call work mode. (laughs) Right. That's um, true. You literally nothing else is on your mind and you just like, you snap. Mm -hmm. Like, and it's not being mean. It's not being, you know, cruel. It's just blunt and very like, this is what's happening. And you sort of especially when you were younger would bulldoze is what I called it yeah over people so I think like if you look at that I would say that yeah you were lower on the scale yeah for sure um but like I said like it's all about like learning things and I feel like you've learned a lot of these things yeah, like, in the last couple years I mean I I would say that I've even had people use some of these words like in, in friendships and stuff like to right. describe like loyal, um, right. helpful and stuff like that. So right. like reading through this list, I would say that I am higher on the agreeable 
not as not 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 as high as you, but higher. Mm-hmm. Um, but then, like the it does say like the low end can be um, blunt, which mm-hmm. I mean I absolutely am sarcastic, right. which I absolutely am right. Um, and callous, rude, ill-tempered, and, and antagonistic, um, which you used to be. Honestly, when you yeah. were young twenties, I would have described you as that. <laughs> yeah, probably. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, no, it's all good. I but mean, I think I was. I think that's the point, though, right? Like, um, obviously, we change and grow, and like you learn who you are, and like how to fix it, mm-hmm. how to fix the things that you don't like. Yeah. Um. So I would say you're much more agreeable than you used to be. Um. But I still like if you're comparing like me to you, I just. I feel like my agreeableness is like to a fault sometimes. Like I'm Mm -hmm. just like off the charts. It's absurd. Right. But like you, I feel like you're on like in a good spot on the scale. Like, (laughs) I don't know because I can't be critical and, um, in a way honest with people. Like if I have a problem with someone, it's like, it kills me for years. Like I can't Mm -hmm. say it to anybody's face. It kills me. So I feel like, on a certain level, the high of my agreeableness, it can be detrimental. So on that agreeable to a fault is that is where, uh, that's the next thing I kind of want to talk about. Okay. So, I mean, I think that agreeableness can also, the, the high end of agreeableness can be also negative mm-hmm. in the fact of people pleasing, mm-hmm. um, because you're so, high on that spectrum that you make your decisions based on being agreeable to others and not right. stepping out and making the right decision mm-hmm. for fear of not being included in the group or mm-hmm. stepping outside of what is deemed socially acceptable and things like that because you're so agreeable to what is the norm or what mm-hmm. people expect of you that you're making detrimental decisions to what is actually better for your life? So, yes. But I wouldn't say that I'm, like, agreeable to the f- to a fault because I'm scared of the no- not being in the norm. No, and I'm, and I'm not even saying that specifically talking at you. I know. I'm just, I'm just like, this is kind of the thoughts I'm having. Because Here, let me get into why I'm having these thoughts. Okay. I, they aren't even original. It's because <laughs> in... In Malcolm Gladwell's podcast of um, his rules of life, the, the reason he talked about this is specifically he talked about agreeableness, and he talked about. Um, so he's talking. He, he started with sports, and he's talking about how um, in hockey there's this thing called pulling the goalie, and typically this doesn't happen. Um, That's and, what happened in the World Cup yesterday. No, oh. um, it's different. Um, so they call it pulling the goalie. Um, whenever you, well, I guess that is what happened yesterday. Um, sorry. Anyways, it does, sorry. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, so there's a thing that's pulling the goalie and it's like in the last few, just like a, two minutes mm-hmm. of, of the game. Um, if you are down by one, um, the math says like, if you're talking like money ball type stuff, um, if you're looking at the numbers and the statistics, the math says that if you pull the goalie, um, and you're one, if you're one down one, mm-hmm. um, you take the goalie, put him on the offense, or mm-hmm. you're actually pulling the goalie and putting another another offensive player in there and just leaving the goal un, un, unattended mm-hmm. so that you have another player uh, on the offense trying to get you a point and so that you tie or win the game. And so, but the math, like the theory of that, um, you know, is that you could do that. Um, like if you're down by three, you could pull the goalie and put in another offensive player like 12 minutes. Um, you know, I don't remember the exact numbers, but you could do that. But the reason nobody does that in the game is because of agreeableness. Because if you were to do that, like if the coach was to do that, like 12 minutes in the game is tons of time mm-hmm. for the other team to score so many points. Um, basically, the coach could not do that and be like widely accepted as like a great coach. Um, but why, like what? Well, because if, if it fails, I mean, you know what I mean? Like it's, it's not the norm. Oh. It's not the social norm to do that. Okay. So that's not like, that's the reason I mentioned this. Cause that's kind of like the trajectory that, um, Malcolm like took to begin this story. I'm not like a huge sports person to be able to explain like <laughs> all the nuances of that. Yeah. But the one that he gets to though, is 
he starts talking about um, a movie and specifically talking about a home invasion and okay. talking about uh, how all, um, states that have enacted um, stand your ground laws, which is um, so in, previously um, there the the law of the of the land is that if you are being if somebody enters, enters your property or if you're being attacked in some way, the law is that you need to do everything in your power to get away mm-hmm. before you use force on the on the person in self-defense. Um, so essentially, if somebody broke into our house and and you just immediately killed them, mm-hmm. um, you like they they like break down the door, you shoot them dead and you can't like if, if there's a like a clear, mm-hmm. you know, uh, path of exit that you could have easily got away and not have to kill somebody. It actually would have been, I don't know what the punishment would have been, but it actually wouldn't have been legal for you to kill that person. Hmm. But then states enacted these stand your ground laws where if somebody's on your property, it doesn't matter. Like if you, you have the right to kill them. And so the reason he's talking about this is because the studies show that states that have enacted stand your ground laws, homicide rates have actually increased Hmm. in those states because of the people standing their ground being killed. Um, and, oh, the, oh, like the homeowners, right. The homeowners being killed. being killed. Oh, cause they're like, oh, I don't have to leave. I can kill you. Right. And then they actually get killed. Right. And, and obviously, I mean, I think probably the, uh, the homicide numbers are also increased by the people, the being invaders killed. being right. killed as well. I would assume. But as far as like, um, you know, the, 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 he gets to like basically the white, men gun owners mm-hmm. that are standing their ground are typically the ones who end up being murdered um, yeah. because they again because of going to this agreeableness in that they are they need to protect their family mm-hmm. and that if they were to run that would be looked down upon in their culture right as not manly as not manly as not standing their ground and making sure that they protect um, mm-hmm. but they would have had way more chance of surviving if they would have just ran yeah um, and they wouldn't be dead um, and so he goes into, I don't remember exactly what movie it is. I remember that the, uh, main character is Idris Elba. Um, and I- Idris, like, uh, it's character breaks into this house and, or it isn't breaking the house. Sorry. He, um, comes to the person's house and says like he, his car broke down and like, Hey, can uh, I like, you know, come in and use your phone? And like, they're, him. they're waiting on like the, um, tow truck. And then the, there's, it's just a, a, a woman and her child that's in the home alone. And she realizes, like, at, through through the movie, that yeah, I don't think this guy is actually yeah, you know, he's creepy, good. Um, I, I think he might be a sociopath or whatever. Um, and so they're talking about that and um, how she ends up like finding him upstairs with her kid, just like playing or whatever. And you know, in in, in like the creepy way. I um, really hate those types of movies with the music and all that. Yeah. Ugh. So uh cut this down yeah um so the point is if you were in that situation and he is with you know you realize that this person is possibly going to murder you right up to something yes and you have the chance like he 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 went upstairs but you know your kids upstairs Mm -hmm. but he went upstairs and you have a clear path to the door and you could run and you could go get help or you could call, you know, whatever, whatever you could do. Would you stay because your child's upstairs or would you run? Well, I feel like I'm not qualified to answer that because I am not a person who has a child. Um, I mean, I think if you're logically thinking, you could maybe head to the neighbors real quick and be like, call 911 right now and then run back over. But also in the moment, are you really going to be like, oh, I'm going to leave the house with my daughter upstairs with some strange, creepy man? Mm-hmm. I mean, probably not. So the... I don't know. The point is, the, uh, the talking about the agreeableness scale here, is that most people would fall in, in the high agreeableness state here that they won't leave their child because... Right. I mean, and I this may not be conscious, but... Like you, you want to protect the kid, but the best thing you could do to protect the kid is actually to get help because right. the person who is, you know, possibly going to kill you is actually 
maybe using the kid to get to you um, and, and, and basically um, holding the kid over you that if you do anything, right, I'm going to like, uh, you know, I'm going to kill you or I'm going to kill the kid or whatever um, versus like your chances of survival being that if you were to run out and then the, he realized that like, oh, you got away, he now has to, has the choice of like, the, the authorities could be here in any minute now because like mm-hmm. she ran out right. um, and has gotten help. So I need to get out if I don't want to be get caught. Um, obviously there is the chance of that person still killing your kid. Right. But there's also most likely if he's killing your kid, he's killing you as well. And so it's like, but then I, you know, I completely understand like, but then there's the thing of how could you live with yourself afterward Right. But then at the same time, you're still living. Right. Um, but, yeah, I don't know. So that's a that's the example that Malcolm, like, gave, you know, to tell the story of, of like, uh, you know, the agreeableness factor and things and like that. And how it can be a bad thing. Um, but I think what that made me, you know, think about is dish decision making in general. Mm-hmm. And... How even given the facts, the figures, the statistics Mm -hmm. on what is ultimately better for us as people for, you know, whether that's just to score more points in a game or to save our life, we will make decisions based on the, our agreeableness, um, with society at large, Mm -hmm. with family, Mm -hmm. with whoever to our own detriment and put ourselves in scenarios where we're less likely to win or less or more likely to be injured or you mm-hmm. know die or whatever because of the fear of looking a certain way to those we're closest to or those just in general to people in mm-hmm. general and what it made me i think this is a concept that Malcolm Gladwell is also fascinated with because he had this whole podcast that's about the agreeableness scale but then he also in season 1 of his podcast um, th- did another uh, one called uh, the big man big man can't shoot I believe is what it's titled and I actually did a whole video kind of based around uh, this concept and this is it's just like one of those podcasts that has resonated with me so much that like it's one that I always think about I guess uh, mm-hmm. or just like has stuck with me there's just like those those few like stories or movies or whatever that just like For some reason, just stick with you and you think about them like this is another one. And this particular podcast, it wasn't about agreeableness, but it was more so about, uh, they call it threshold and your threshold uh, for collective behavior, essentially. And I think that the threshold, um, the study of the threshold model of collective behavior and agreeableness almost like are the same. Mm -hmm. Um, So... Should I keep talking? Um, yeah. <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> I feel like I've been talking for like, uh, okay. So, um, so the thresholds of collective behavior is kind of the, the, uh, thesis of the, of his other, uh, of that particular podcast. And I get a little like fired up talking about this because <laughs> I, it, I, I don't know. I don't know why I'm so passionate about it. I guess it's maybe because it's part of who I am. Like mm-hmm. I am so low high on the threshold scale it's opposite of you're low on agreeableness yeah it's the opposite scale of agreeableness but it it correlates to be the same like high threshold and low agreeableness i think are the same Mm -hmm. um maybe no i think both are low it doesn't matter anyways um (laughs) so uh the threshold theory or whatever so the the way he talks about this one is talking about the basketball player back in the day wilt chamberlain and wilt chamberlain was an all-star basketball player who he holds like i think he might still hold the record for the most free throws Mm -hmm. made in a season of nba basketball um and if it's if he's not number one anymore he's still like in the top like three and so but the reason he was able to make so many free throws was because he shot underhand he shot like granny style Mm -hmm. and it is statistically proven that shooting that way at the free throw line will be, will make more shots than if you were to shoot it overhand, like people are taught. Mm -hmm. But if you notice that nobody in the NBA 
except for there are like uh, there's like one person um nobody in the nba shoots underhand and because you look dumb because you look dumb Mm -hmm. because you you look like a sissy like you will be made fun of if you shoot underhand Mm -hmm. but like my problem with this is why does anybody freaking care if somebody's making fun of you if you're making the shots if you're winning the game if you're not dead who do why do you care if people what what people care about you and so like this is so i i mean just so i don't like tell that whole because i could talk about that story for a long time because I, i love that story but i did do just I did do a video about that on our YouTube channel, and it's called um, I Don't Care, I believe. I'll link it in the show notes um, if you want to watch it, but um, just to not, just to save time on the podcast, I won't like, I'll leave it at that because I think that explains kind of what it is. Yeah. But just so we open up that conversation, that's the basis of where I'm coming from Mm -hmm. with the scale of agreeableness. So if people who are, I'm going to talk about the threshold scale and kind of in, in that, and maybe this correlates with agreeableness, but, um, so threshold, let's say there's a, uh, group of people, like a large group of people hanging out near a cliff and somebody jumps off like, you know, to into the water or whatever. Mm-hmm. So that's that first person, somebody who is really low on the threshold scale is going to just follow quickly. Like, you know, they just do it. Mm-hmm. Um, they, somebody else did it. They just do it. And then the, basically people with the lower threshold scale, they just begin jumping um, into the water, um, just following suit really quickly. All the way up to like grandma, Mm -hmm. who is going to have a really high threshold scale where to her, it doesn't matter how many people are doing it. I'm not going to do that. And she has a high threshold of collective behavior before she's ever going to do something like that. And, uh, so a high threshold of collective behavior is going to correlate to a low agreeableness scale mm-hmm. because grandma doesn't care what you think about people jumping off a cliff. She's not going to do it. And somebody who's really low on an agreeable scale is like, I don't care that everybody else is doing this thing or they or that they're going to think of me as a certain way if I do this other thing. Mm-hmm. But that's who I am and that's what I'm going to do because that's what I know is better for me. And not doing it because they care about what other people think. Okay, well, that was, I just. (sighs) You just get so excited you can't talk. (laughs) Okay, so I went on a little uh, diatribe there. Um, I'm going to shut up now. Did did that make sense? What do you think? Give me your thoughts. Yes, it made sense. Um you feel a lot of things about it. So (laughs) first of all, I think I was thinking about this because I said I'm high on agreeableness. But then like when you were saying if someone jumps off the cliff, like someone high on agreeableness or is it low threshold? Yeah. Would just like follow suit. And that's not true. I don't really give in to peer pressure. Like I don't really care how many people are trying to get me to do something. If I don't want to do it, I'm not going to do it. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, I, I don't think that the, there can be a one-to-one correlation between agreeableness and threshold. I think they are two separate things. I think you can be on a scale of on yeah. both, but I think that they I do think they high, make me think of each other. I do think high threshold and low agreeableness do correlate, or at least I see that a lot in you. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think I don't know. There's a certain I uh, I don't know. I think like. I like that I'm high in agreeableness. Like to me, it means like empathetic and kind Mm -hmm. and like understanding of individuals. Um, But I do also understand that I can be very like, but well, it depends on the situation. I think it depends on the circumstances, but like I have a hard time sometimes like I'll write something and then for the life of me, I just argue with myself for like three days because I don't want to post it and have somebody misunderstand me and mm-hmm. go through this, you know, I like go back and forth and back and forth is, is this oversharing? Is this too much? Do people even want to know? Do, you know? I just like kill myself over all of these questions, which has, I think, mostly to do with the fact that I want people to understand me, which mm-hmm. would be agreeableness, I think. 
Yeah, I mean, I think a part of it, but that also goes into the insecurity and like the other stuff right. too. Right. But I think that that does have a part of this the high scale of agreement. Yeah, like I want people to like me. Who doesn't, mm-hmm. right? But I do think, like, I don't know. I would. Am I a people pleaser? I mean, I wouldn't put you like on the extreme people pleaser spectrum Mm -hmm. but i definitely think you have a little bit of people pleaseness like in you yeah actually i mean i think maybe you just could be a people pleaser i i I don't know like i feel like we have this conversation a lot where i'm just you want to do something or you want to say something or you want to post something or whatever and you're like but i mean blah 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 and i literally every time i'm like who cares just do it (laughs) Why do you care what other people think? Like, why are you why are you worrying so much about what other people are going to think about it? If 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 this is what you want to do, if this is if you believe in the message you're trying to say, I mean, I don't disagree logically. Just do it. It makes sense, but like, there is a piece of me that's just like terrified that people are going to misunderstand. Or I think also it has a lot to do with um, maybe like putting too much of my feeling out there. Not that, not because I don't believe in that. Cause I very much believe in that. I like the people I admire the most are the people who just say all the things. Mm-hmm. Um, but like, there's a piece of me that is, is like terrified to do that. Cause then like, what will they look at me? What will they think of me in real life? Right. Like, and it's not so much like strangers but people I know, like I don't want people I know to see me in person the next time. And like, shy away because they think I'm crazy you Mm -hmm. know so there's like that piece of it that I can't I think is agreeableness that's hard for me to get over that I think is a detriment to like myself Mm -hmm. and what I do but like I wouldn't say I don't think I have necessarily like a low threshold I mean I wouldn't shoot granny style I do know that see that I wouldn't that like blows my mind (laughs) but like i very much i mean uh, like i understand like i say it blows my mind but i also like i see that one like 99.9 percent of nba players and college basketball players and like anybody who plays basketball ever Mm -hmm. like don't do it Mm -hmm. um and so like it's not like you're weird like you know it blows my mind because you're so weird i think it blows my mind because i'm so weird you know what i mean like if i it, like we went out and we went like we went to a public court right now and we played. I would shoot underhand because well, I know the I know the data that if I practice the underhand shot, that that will ultimately lead to me scoring more shots. But that's different than like in a game. Oh, I mean, I would do it in a game too. I mean, I, I know. I'm but- just I threw that context just because in what context am I going to be on a, a team playing <laughs> basketball? You know, so true. <laughs> I don't know. That I, was a little bit stretch even for a hypothetical. Yeah. <laughs> I do think it's like, it's interesting because, oh man, I don't know. Maybe agreeableness. No, I don't know. I like that I'm agreeable. I like. Of I course like, you do. That's what, that would, no, well, that's what an agreeable person would say. <laughs> but I mean, I mean that in the sense, like, I like that I am capable of understanding other people and like I think that's a really big strength but then like how do you like keep that but still but then like not be a people pleaser or whatever like can they be separated yeah and I think like I mean I I was being more facetious there I mean because I think I would also as far as like maybe the big five the ocean like traits I mean I would Rather, I would love to have the traits of somebody who's high in uh, agreeableness. Uh-huh. And and maybe more my thing is um, being a healthy amount of agreeableness for like uh-huh. just being empathetic and like it, it, taking into consideration other people's feelings and thoughts and like mm-hmm. preferences and which I feel like I have learned to do. Yeah, I think so. Um, and I mean... I would say even learn to the point where it is a part of me now. Um, not to the scale of you. Mm-hmm. Like I, in no way am I saying like it, it's like. Feeling you, a natural feeling. Yeah. Um, but like as far as like I feel like that's a regular part of me. But more so 
maybe I'm 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 more so passionate about the threshold side of it. Yeah, I think for sure. Um, because I don't want to be so low on the agreeable scale. Like I don't care about what anybody possibly could think that I'm like rude and brash and like everything mm-hmm. else. But also, like, I don't want to like we talked about this on the Enneagram podcast too. Is like I don't want to like tiptoe around stuff and right. like beat around the bush and like you know try to people please my way through life it's like there are things that just need to be said or yeah you know whatever that like it's not personal okay but here's a question and this is sort of off what you just said but Mm -hmm. it doesn't have anything to do with it but it has to do with agreeableness so i was having this conversation with one of my friends but we were talking about how like agreeableness niceness you know like is very I mean, I would say it's like a good trait and like a quality trait that people should strive to have. But generally speaking, nice people, agreeable people get taken advantage of. Mm -hmm. Um, So I guess like, do you think that's true? And how do you be like a highly agreeable, whatever that means, person and not allow people to take advantage of you? Mm -hmm. Is that, does that come with like... What's the, the other one that, like, makes you assertive? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I think, like, that is where uh, the breakdown comes in, like, only five traits, like, to define mm-hmm. a person. And, like, that, you know, obviously those are just traits that are on a spectrum and, like, each person can have pop-outs of, like, right. each one of those. But, yes, I do think that people can be nice to a fault um, and... And uh, nice, I don't think is even the right word there. Um, right. But you know, I mean, that's the, there's a whole like stigma or the reason that the saying is like nice guys finish last because right. it's more so that you allow yourself to be pushed over. So it's not about being nice; it's about being a pushover. Is it about being pushed over though? I, I mean, yes, it is. But my thing is, so like, I don't feel like I'm a pushover, but I feel like people know. Maybe it is a pushover. Maybe I just have never defined myself that way. I mean... But I feel like, you know, the people who are not nice, who mm-hmm. are, like, less inclined to be fair to people, right. are the people who get ahead. And that makes me so upset. Like, right. I, it's hard for me to handle that. Yeah. But, like, I'm not going to do the same thing. Like, I'm, I refuse to treat people the way they treat people. Mm-hmm. So does that mean I'm just never going to get ahead? Like, I don't... No. You know what I mean? Like, what? How do you, right? Do that? I mean? So, uh, so, I think that it's. I think you can have both. Yeah. Um, because I think there are people who are strong, like people. They have strong willpower. They mm-hmm. they don't allow themselves to be pushed over mm-hmm. by others, and yet possess the uh, the character traits of being empathetic Mm -hmm. and being a joy to be around (laughs) you know what I mean like (laughs) yeah um but then uh, okay here's perfect this is a a very uh micro example that most of you won't understand but just for I guess just Sarah but like (laughs) I mean Matt Nelson our previous like pastor yeah and, and boss like I would say that he fits that description that in no way would he allow himself to be you know, pushed right. over and he's like going to be strong in who he is. And, um, but also is a very nice person mm-hmm. and his whole entire profession right. is based around other people. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. I guess I just, how do you do that? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what's the, what, not just the big five, but like, what are the traits that like an agreeable person should work on? Um, yeah, improving, I mean, I, th- I guess like, I think it's because I, th- I would say I'm an assertive individual. Like, I don't feel like I like shrink away from people or even in like professional setting. I mean, again, right. it depends on the situation, but even like when I go into a job, like I've, I've learned how to be pretty assertive in like who I am and what I'm doing and you know, my work, but like, I still don't feel like I'm one of those people who are just going to like get ahead. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, okay, so this is, I just had this thought that maybe it's the combination of the agree, the high agreeableness 
uh-huh. and the high um, conscientious conscientious of um, like because it's the it's whenever you have the high agreeableness and the low conscientiousness um, mm-hmm. of being um, uh, uh, not confident, mm-hmm. insecure, you know, and anxious about what other people think about you while at the same time trying to, you know, be agreeable to others to be um, nice. And I don't like the word using the word nice because I, right. I think all. You know, it's just because the saying yeah, nice yeah. guys finish. Um, and so like basically you can be warm and fuzzy mm-hmm. um but then if you are confident in who you are mm-hmm. and confident in what you know and what you believe and you know you're strong in that i think that whenever the, both of those are high that is like a really solid like combination for success mm-hmm. and getting and obviously there are many 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 people who in our capitalistic like world right get ahead you know, just by the really low agreeableness, um, right. and, and the high conscientiousness. Right. Um, but I think having the high in both is whenever you fall into exactly what you're talking about, where you're not undercutting everybody else so you can get ahead. Right. You're bringing everybody else with you. Right. And I never want to be the person who like has connections just because they're a good connection. Right. Right. Like I, I will never be that person. I will never be like, Oh, I'm going to, get in with that crowd because Mm -hmm. like no if i don't think i'll be friends with you then i'm just not gonna right you know yeah it's like i want to but that's not to say that you can't be mutually beneficial right i feel like that's totally fine but like that can't be the only reason you're trying to be friends with people right you have to i mean you want to love people the the end like love people to love people and and not you know I, i feel like there's this this may be a little off topic, but, um, like the new, like, uh, LA thing of like, (laughs) you know, how many followers do you have? You know what I mean? Like you, you, you do not fit in my circle. Right. Because you don't fit. 30,000 minimum or I don't talk to you. You don't fit in my follower count. Right. Um, and so like, you know, that is absurd. Um, and I think really low on the agreeableness scale. Mm-hmm. not a fun person to be around so do you think our society or our culture is like diminishing ag- agreeableness like that trait in people do you think it's like the way that we're living and the way that we're like growing up do you think it's like i almost think both though because um i think that and, and maybe i'm misinterpreting agreeableness in that way of like somebody who like who cares so much about like a lot of the people other maybe they actually they <gasps> are high on followers like high on agreeableness because they care about what other people think about them so much like people pleasing you know, like people like all that type of stuff but let's just say they are low on the agreeableness scale i think that also society at large is getting even higher on the agreeableness scale in the fact that we care so much about political correctness and we care so much about you know not offending anybody because of our um culture of outrage and making sure that we and we've talked about this on the podcast too of like even right. even though we don't even like i don't know uh, put ourselves in that camp of like trying to make sure we don't you know right. hurt like step on anybody's toes um type thing um we still find ourselves editing ourselves because of the culture of outrage mm-hmm. um and that something that is not ill meaning at all Right. can be taken out of context or maybe we just said something because uh, we're ignorant about it mm-hmm. and we thought something completely different. And then like once we had, were educated on it, we're like, oh, dang, that was dumb. Yeah, right. um, but we still said that sentence before, right. which can still be used against us it, 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 to our extreme detriment. Right. Um, because yeah, like it can ruin your whole life. <laughs> um, now because of the, yeah. the outrage culture we're in. Um so I, that's I, interesting. Yeah. So maybe as a whole, like we are, hmm. everybody is getting to a point where it's, I don't know. But maybe the whole Instagram or like the likes and followers, maybe that's more like a, a selfish culture than it is agreeableness. Mm-hmm. Maybe that has more to do with. Like, yeah, because agreeableness would also self- be inclusive, I think. Yeah. I mean, I would say that like you can put yourself in other people's shoes Right? Like, yeah. I would feel like that would be more inclusive. I don't know. Yeah, it's interesting. But we're a very contradictory culture. Yeah. But why wouldn't you shoot underhand? 
in a game yeah if i mean uh, no I, okay in, unless there's not i'm not gonna say like you're in a game and all of a sudden you're just gonna shoot underhand like because you think maybe you're gonna make it right. but i mean like you actually practiced right i used to practice underhand um and I used you to practice everything like you you actually practiced and you you know your stats that um nine out of ten of under underhanded you make it mm-hmm. and six out of ten overhand you make first it. first of all i made more than six out of ten <laughs> Second of all, sorry, my all star. Um, <laughs> but let's just say those were your stats, and you knew okay. that. And then that's but you, but that was in practice, and nobody ever really saw that. Mm-hmm. Then it comes down to game when you get fouled, one second on the on the timer, you're you're one point behind, <laughs> two points behind. You have to make both of them, and <laughs> and they put and you you're there. You know, mm-hmm. like this is the only chance. I understand. I would not do it probably. Why? Because here's the thing, and I don't have an answer, but I can kind of like relate it to something else. It's the same reason why I, I like kind of refuse to read like fluff books, like Twilight or something. There's like a thing that is just like, you know, <laughs> <laughs> like, a, I don't know. I don't know what it is. Snobbishness. But that's why. <laughs> I, I don't know. I can't tell you. I, it's not because, it's not because, I know you're not going to believe me when I say this. It's not because. How? Of peer pressure. No, not even peer, I'm not even talking peer pressure. I'm just, that is like caring what other people think about you. Well, yeah, I care what other people think about me. Yeah. I want, I, we're all crafting our image, you know? Okay, but think about this. <laughs> you make both of those shots because mm-hmm. you shoot you have a much higher statistic of making them underhand. You make both of them. You win the game. I understand. And, and then you, I'm a hero. Yeah, and you and you still care what people think about you. You know what they're going to think? Sarah made those shots, and now we won the game. No, Lift they're going to say, I mean, she was weird, but okay. No, they're not. Yeah. No. Okay. No. Yes. No. Yes, you would be talked about because you did something different. Also, that... Which I guess is not gives, a bad thing. I would be okay with that. Also, that gives too much... That is a little self-centered, uh, selfish in the fact that you think that people think that much about you. You know well, what I mean? Well, okay. First of all, every single one of us feels that way. I know. And it is true that people don't think about us as much as we as think much as we do. think they're thinking about us. Yeah. Nobody actually cares what anybody else is doing. That's true. And that's why you should shoot underhand. Okay. And also why you should run out of the building if you're if there's a murderer. <laughs> If you have a clear path out, that is your safest option, even mm. if it makes you look like a coward. Who freaking cares if you're a coward if you're alive? Listen, if it was only me, I would for sure run out. The question I think there is about the child. And and but that is child, a little more difficult to explain. Right. But the child's uh, well-being is actually increased by you running out. I understand. But it doesn't change help. it doesn't change what you're thinking in the moment. I understand, like logically speaking, we can understand that, but in the moment as a mother, are you going to be like, I'm going to leave my daughter up there with a creepy guy who just barged into my house while I run away? I mm. mean, probably not. I That's mean, a really difficult thing to do and say. I haven't been a mother yet, so I can't say. Exactly. But I would um, implore right. logic. Right. I feel like of all people, you would be able to be logical. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, but also I tend to like... Um, I don't know. I feel like, well, yeah, like in situations like that. Mm-hmm. I mean, I've never been in a situation where I'm almost being going to be murdered. <laughs> but like fight or flight situations. Right. I feel like I freeze. Yeah, I definitely. Yeah. And then like two seconds later, you're like, oh, I should have killed that person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I think so, actually, which is kind of weird because you, I would I would guess you'd be I, okay, like very so logical in I the think, moment. Uh, I've thought about actually thought about this quite a bit, <sighs> and I didn't. I mean, I I'm just thinking of this thought right now, but I think maybe the reason I freeze is more so because my my fight or flight mm-hmm. is to fight, mm. and I freeze because I am talking myself out of it. That's possible. Because of my agreeableness. Mm. That's possible. Because, like, my... I feel like my initial, like, 
response would be to get myself into a bad situation where I'm like, well, that's happened before. Remember? Uh, yeah, I know. Um, you know, like I think feel like my got us murder. <laughs> no, uh, yeah. I feel like my fight or flight. He talked back to a gang member on a public transportation. We almost died. Well, you know, I don't care who you are. You need to respect people. <laughs> I don't care. I almost died. Oh, I'm, which is I'm, a I'm little saying you. I'm saying but... just because he's a gang member doesn't mean he should be disrespectful. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And he should know. The. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> and it did almost turn out ugly. It did. But an older ex-gang member stepped in and talked, talked him, him out of it. So that was it good. so thankful for that guy. <laughs> um, I can sometimes have a mouth. <laughs> <laughs> you don't say. <laughs> yeah, but I get, maybe that's it. You, you were very easy to speak in the moment. But like you're you're not quick to react, maybe because you're talking yourself out of doing something you'll regret, possibly. I'm definitely talking myself out of doing something I regret, like because I have if thoughts gonna, of doing things. If you're gonna speak, you gotta back it up. So oh, either I would either back it up. do nothing. I mean, look at me. I would totally back it up. <laughs> if you, if you've never seen our, any of our videos and you're just listening to this, I'm like six three, <laughs> two hundred and thirty pounds. Is that a good number for that? I have no idea. Uh, <laughs> Probably. <laughs> Um, if you, and, I mean, like, if you, if you can't tell by my, uh, <laughs> my manly deep voice that, uh, I could take on anybody, oh, uh, yeah. if you're watching, don't tell them. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think maybe that's the case. Maybe you're, you're trying to talk yourself out of it. So let me ask you the question. Why? Why, why what? though? Why what? Why are you trying to be agreeable? R about what? In a situation when you're talking yourself out of doing something. Oh, I don't something. think I'm trying to be agreeable. I'm just trying to, I'm trying to do the logical thing. Like I'm, my logic is taking over my fight or flight because mm. it's not logical to punch somebody in the face right. who's bigger throw than your me. throw boosted board at someone. Or... Right. Like, because my, my fight response is, is not logical. It's, it's primal. But my logic That's takes over true. and stops me from doing things. And then later my uh like imagination brain mm -hmm. is like but think about what if you would have done that like, yeah yeah that would have been awesome because then you could have had this awesome story listen that like, is so true because something happens and then hours later you're like man what if i would have blah, blah, and you're like telling me this whole story about how you would have oh man i think about it so long <laughs> but the thing is is my 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 imagination and my daydreams are like the best case scenario. As is everyone's, yeah. And so most likely the outcome of all of those situations, if I would have done the thing that I think would have been awesome, I would have been beat up. Yeah, you probably would have died. Um, so my logic brain says, hey, you're not that 6'3", 240 pound guy that you are in your head, um, so don't do that. <laughs> gotcha. So you're not being agreeable. You're just talking yourself out of it. I'm just a realist, and I know yeah, that... I, you are definitely so. a realist. But I mean, there all also have been times in my life where I feel like I have uh, my fight or flight has been just straight flight. Mm -hmm. Like I'm out, like yeah. immediately. Like and and I'm talking like it's so primal, like that I fly that I didn't even think to bring you with me. Uh, no, that happened one time. I don't remember what the situation was. Do you remember? There was I was so mad at you because you all but pushed me in front of the moving car, you know? No, yes. No. It was something... It wasn't that, I mean, I definitely didn't... It wasn't like throwing you under the bus to no. protect myself, but it was more so that, like, it was... We were in some sort of situation, and I, I fled with not even a millisecond's, like, thought. Yeah. And then was like, oh, crap, Sarah's still back there. It, but you didn't stop. You just kept going. <laughs> you can't even think that... that. Well, I don't know if that's true, because we don't even... Can't remember the exact situation, but I, I do remember, remember that happening, for I sure. I remember being so mad... I was like, who is this guy? <laughs> Why am I with him? <laughs> Doesn't even care about me. Uh, one last uh, um, story on a, on a fight or flight or flight. Even, uh, that's not where we started this conversation. You know yeah, who cares? Yeah. Um, whenever I was a kid, um, it was like I was probably a teenager um, and well, probably pre-teen, junior high, somewhere around there. Anyways, I was sitting in a, a car that was parked on a very... I mean, a slight hill, mm -hmm. um, and it was it was pointing with the nose up the hill, 
and it was myself, my sister, and my sister's best friend. And it was my sister's best friend's car. And it was a, uh, it was like an old VW Bug, and it was a manual. And they were sitting in the front two seats, and I was in the back, in a two door car. Mm-hmm. Keep that in mind. <laughs> two door car. I'm in the back. <laughs> My sister, she's five years younger than me, so I don't know what what age would have been around there, but eight years old, let's just say. I don't know. Um, they end up hitting the uh, the stick thing in yeah. the manual car, um, you know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, this is what I'm talking about. <laughs> what? The, why I shouldn't fight people. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um. So they end up hitting the, uh, what is this, what's the thing called? I don't know. The, the shifter. Sure. <laughs> um, I've driven a manual like once, <laughs> twice actually. Uh, I've never uh, have. Um, I, the, the, you know, the downshift right, thing. Right. Yeah. yeah. I, I killed it both times. I have never driven a manual since. <laughs> um, anyways, uh, they ended up hitting that and it put it in, into neutral and it started rolling backwards down the hill. And I'm talking within, I mean, it probably was one second, one Mississippi. <laughs> I was out of the back seat and outside of the car with them two still in the car. I don't even know how it happened. And I, I, I just, I was outside the car and I was running inside to uh, tell my dad and and, and uh, his best friend, who's mm-hmm. anyways, tell the driver, the owner of the car, and my dad that. The car's running down the hill, and so like I, I run in there, um, and I didn't even like look back at, to my sister or her friend or where the car was going. All I know is I I was out, and I made it in there. And I also this is kind of funny. I I I don't know why. Whenever I was a kid, I had this massive aversion to interrupting people. Mm-hmm. I, I maybe that's part of being high in agreeableness at some point in my life or something, but. I, I mean, you still hate interrupting. I do hate interrupting very much so. And I hate interrupting, like, I hate whenever I interrupt people because sometimes you just, like, get passionate in the moment and, like, start speaking. I'm like, dang it. Ah. Mm-hmm. Um, but then also, like, I hate being interrupted. Um, and, but I this was so strong in me at that age that I literally, I run in there and they're in the middle of this conversation. So, like, I'm, like, sprinting and then I run right up to them and they're talking. So I just stop. <laughs> And I just look at it. Meanwhile, him. your sister is dying yes. outside. <laughs> and like, I like wait and I wait and I'm like, okay, quick, finish your sentence, finish your sentence, finish your sentence. And then like, they, they finish talking and I remember like, uh, the car was rolling down the hill and they're like, what? <laughs> your poor sister. <laughs> uh, I don't know what context I would have to tell, um, this story ever. So I'm going to tell it now anyway, because it has to do with my, not wanting to interrupt people. Okay. I'll make it really fast. So the, I, I was around that same age time. I was uh, really into BMX, like biking. And I was on my my bike and I was like doing little jumps or whatever. And I slipped a pedal and the pedals on my Oof. bike had like, you know, I don't know, eighth inch tall, like, yeah, you know, little sp- like spikes or whatever to like, you know, grip for your feet. Well, I slipped a pedal. It came up and slammed into my shin. And it cut me. I, I mean, that's probably one of the only scars I still have from stuff is like on my shin from that. And it like you could see the bone um, and it was Ugh. like bleeding, like running okay. down my my foot and my leg into my sock and just like blood everywhere. <laughs> well, anyways, I put my bike down. I walk. My dad is nearby talking to a guy and I like put my bike down and I like walk over to my dad to tell him. And he's in the middle of this conversation. And so I just walk up and stand there. And just wait. And I'm like, in the meantime, there's blood just like rushing down my my leg, but I didn't want to interrupt him. Um, and this has nothing to do with my dad either, because my dad in no way ever was like... He didn't care. Like, he's, he is a pushover type. Like, he yeah. wouldn't care if I, uh, like, interrupted him. Yeah. And so it wasn't like it, in fear of my dad. I just had, I just had this thing about in, <laughs> interrupting people. And so I, I'm just like standing there mm-hmm. and waiting for their conversation to end and then um the guy that my dad is talking to he just like looks over and he like sees all the blood and he's like i think i think your son needs you and and my dad looks over like i'm bleeding (laughs) you're such a weird kid (laughs) Uh, i'm bleeding (laughs) i don't know i don't know why like in what i don't know what trait that is 
Like, I could have just walked in and be like, hey, dad, I'm bleeding. Like, mm-hmm. would have been fine. Hey, look, but... you can see the bone yeah. in my leg. But, oh, well. That's... <laughs> just thought I'd tell you that story. Never interrupt, Cody. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, so, yeah, that's where that ended up being. Yep. Um, agreeableness to that. So, that, I don't know. I, I had fun talking about it, though. You did. Yeah. This was your soapbox, I feel like. <laughs> it is. Not caring what other people think about you is one of my big soapboxes. Like, just being confident and like insecure in who you are and, like, doing what's best, no matter if somebody thinks you're an idiot for doing it. Which is just funny because that's do it. the opposite of me. Who cares? If it's best, it's best. Best is best. Like, the li- best is best. And that's where I'm going to end it because I'm going to keep on talking. Okay. Thank you guys for listening to Deeply Curious. Um, if you like the show, make sure to let us know. Um, you can follow both of us on Twitter or Instagram. Um, our Twitter, my Twitter is Cody Jensen. Sarah's is Sarah underscore Jensen. That is the same on Instagram. You can also leave us a comment on the YouTube video. Leave us a review and comment on iTunes as well. That helps the show get spread. Um, lets people other other people know that it's something worth listening to. Yeah. Um, huge thank you to our sponsor, Hint Water. You can check that out by going to hint.co, that's C-O, slash deeply curious, and using that link also helps out the show. Um, also, maybe a little uh, tease here. I've been working on some uh, merch that mm. maybe uh, listen mm. listen for on the, on the next uh, <laughs> episode. So thank you guys for listening, and uh, see you in the next Deeply Curious. Bye. Bye.